Good morning. How are you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still feels quite early, doesn't it? Yeah. He's going to pick on someone now and ask them specifically. Yes, you at the back. No, um, don't worry. Good morning. I'm Andrew. I try and uh, serve on the team here, lead the team here uh, with the beautiful people that I'm with, and uh, I try and serve you. Uh, if I haven't met you, I'm still Andrew, and I'm still here. Um, I know we've got a few people new today, and you're incredibly welcome. Le uh, leaving that welcome slide up for 20 minutes, you know, hopefully you feel welcome. So our tech team are doing, are doing such a good, good job. We found a new button. We didn't even know it existed. We found a button that completely flips around the whole projection system. And then when you press it, it flips it all around again. Isn't that just like life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> basically. Um, what we didn't do was switch it off and switch it back on again, which is apparently the solution to everything. So, um, yeah, there we go. Sun is shining. Sun is shining, isn't it? Summer has finally decided to, to, to arrive. So praise God for all those things. Um, it's good, isn't it, to, to focus on it because there's so much worry in the world. Um, we sung about it a little bit. We sung some beautiful stuff this morning as that part of our, our worship. Um, I, I read uh, someone anonymously saying, I've got a new philosophy. I'm only going to worry about one day at a time. That's the world that, that many of us are kind of on, isn't it? Or in. A guy called Oswald Chambers, a writer Oswald Chambers said, worry though, for us as followers of Jesus, is calculating without God. Worry is calculating without God. It's always important, isn't it, to distinguish between, you know, there's an appropriate awareness, there's an appropriate thing that we bring to life where, you know, I, I meet some people who just don't worry about anything at all and in a, in a not healthy way, actually. Um, of course, there's an appropriate level of, of kind of being sparked about things and, uh, you know, that's important that we notice what matters, that we live intentionally. But God never intends for us to have anxiety, sort of low level, you know, just constant drumbeat. Uh, God never intends that if something's going well, we sort of think to ourselves, well, the rubbish is going to come any minute now. That's not God's intention. Of course, uh, uh, it's all a spectrum. At another end of the spectrum, of course, there are those of us uh, in, in this room uh, who actually struggle with our mental health in a, in a way which really needs all kinds of support. And we encourage that so much because that's a reality, isn't it? But, but on this spectrum that, that we're all on, we're all walking on between kind of no worry at all, I don't care less, I'm not going to bother about tomorrow, right the way through to that kind of scenario of real challenge, especially for many men who just hide it. Women, I realise as well, absolutely. Between there, in those things, God wants to be at work in us because he doesn't, you know, he's not created a world where, where we have to have that sense of calculating without him. There was a, a survey, you might have seen a survey come out re this week about um, attitudes to, to faith and, to, and religion. You might have, might have seen it. And, and in our nation now, less than 50% of people now say that they believe in God. 23% of people in our nation say that God matters to their lives. So less than 50% believe in God and only 23% of the people that you work with, that you live with, that you'll see at the school gate, that you volunteer with, that you're going to shop with, that you'll have a coffee with. Only 23%. And that's so sad, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not primarily sad because of how many may or may not be in a building like this. It's, it's, it's not sad, primarily because of how many people want to be involved in, in the, the community, the religious community, the, 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 the life of the nation and those sort of questions. That's not what's sad. What's sad is, is those people are denying themselves or, or have, been, have been blinded to the hope, the hope. 
That means that you can calculate with God. You can live with God. As we've been sharing in some of our recent series, as Hills and Caris shared a, a couple of Sundays ago, it might even be last Sunday, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Um, that we can pray for heaven's resources and heaven's answers to the things that we all are challenged by. Isn't that the sadness that here we have all those people, all those people that you know and love, maybe even you, who are not connected to the hope that is in Jesus. The hope that's God. Because God is on a mission and so are we. God is on a mission and so are we. There's a slide that has that on it just so you can definitely look at it. God is on a mission and so are we. There's a real danger, isn't there, of talking too much about mission partners. I mean, we love our mission partners. We, we love the people of Kenya uh, we, we grow and we learn so much more from them about faith than, than ever we take. I mean, the taking of a, a four by four will transform lives. It will make a difference. It will, it will save people's lives, quite literally. Yeah, that's how big it is. And if you want to talk about how I can make such bold claims, have a word with me or Harry and Sandy sitting at the back who head up our Kenya partnership. We love our partner, partners because they're part of what it means to be church family, one body in Christ. But there's a danger because it can give the impression that they're doing the mission. That, or I am. Or, or those who are real keenies in church life. They're the ones doing the mission. When the reality is that we are all on mission. We're all always on mission. If 67%, if I've got that right, if 67% of the people that you will see tomorrow and talk to tomorrow do not know the hope that is in Jesus Christ, who's on mission with them? The answer is you, just in case you hadn't spotted that. Because you see, unfortunately for them, they're not going to have me to talk to them. No. I mean, I realise that that would be the golden ticket answer. <laughs> Who are they going to have? Who are they going to have? Who's on mission? Can you just say to yourself, it's me. It's me. It's you. See, the only God we worship, some of you will know this, be very familiar with some of the theological, some of the thinking about God that, that goes underneath what I've just put on that slide. Here's this next slide. In Latin, what's called the Missio Dei. Ancient church, the older church, talked about the Missio Dei, the mission, the sending of God. God is the sending God. And so a writer says, David Bosch, some of you will know this quote, mission is not primarily an activity of the church, but it's an attribute of God. So mission, sharing Jesus, sharing hope, telling the 67% people that this is not all there is to it. By the way, in the survey, more than 50% still believe in an afterlife. So telling the 67%, you've got this hope, you've got this desire that this is not all there is to it. How depressing if this is what, all there was to it. Telling them about the hope that is in God and through God is, is the nature of God. It's an attribute of God. It's not just a task for some. It's rooted in the understanding of God as a perfect community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity, so Trinitarian thinking, applying what it means that this is the only God that we know. He's revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That perfect communion, that perfect relationship of love that overflows. How can we say God is love? Because he is love. Doesn't need us 
for love, because then that would make God dependent upon us. But God is love because God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are loving all of the time to each other. They are in perfect community, perfect communion. And that overflows. That attribute, that nature of God overflows. And you can see the last quote there. It's not the church that has a mission of salvation to fulfill in the world. It's the mission of the Son and the Spirit through the Father that includes the church. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Any of us who follow Jesus for a while, but if you're here new to this and you're thinking about this or watching us online because you want hope in your life, you do know there is something more. There's something bigger. You're, you're daring to believe in the afterlife because you know that death is not the end. Well, here's what Jesus said to those of us who follow us. And notice that all four tasks are for every follower of Jesus. So anyone ever has any doubt about women in ministry or anyone else having any kind of task, if you have assumed that any of these tasks belongs to someone else, then please have a word with Jesus himself. Because Jesus said to you, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Who is called to go? It's me. Just let yourself say, it's you. Who's called to make disciples? Who's called to baptize? Who's called to teach? Now, you might want to sit there and think that, you know, Matthew left a little bit out. Therefore, I am saying to the ministry team and leadership of Holy Trinity, on behalf of all those who belong to the church family, that they should go out. That's wrong, isn't it? That's 67% of people. Who, who's... Who's there for them? Who's there for them? It's not going to be me. I said uh, last week or when I was speaking just recently, and I've said a few times, um, I think a lot of us probably have split lives. Here's a little slide that sort of shows that. So I talk about the, the yellow bit, and, and please don't, it, you won't find this in the Bible, don't overinterpret. It's just making a point. I know that I so often live kind of yellow spaces where I feel really comfortable being a follower of Jesus, doing the stuff, talking about it in a small group, when I'm with you in church, when I'm with other places. That's the, you know, that's my comfortable space. It's yellow the sun is shining but I have this other life that is out there in the blue out in the blue yonder the world out there or with my non-christian friends or the mission field sometimes might almost have been taught and that is a split that's a dualism that's a separation that is not what Jesus calls us into because Jesus calls us and here's just a slide just to try and illustrate in Christ means integration. And that's why I talk about green space as our evangelistic strategy, as our mission strategy as a church. I talk about that space, which actually should be the whole of life, where there's an integration of who I am in Jesus and that world that I'm engaging with. And it's not a garden center for ordinary plants. It's a, a garden center of my life, of your life. For hope. There are people around us, desperate, weighed down by worry, who are holding on to the rough idea that there's a, an afterlife. Death is not the end. Went to a humanist funeral for someone in my family and the civil celebrant, who's not meant to bring any religious stuff to it, when the curtains closed, couldn't stop themselves from saying, we will... Um, We'll meet again. And Nikki and I wanted to jump up and say, you can't say that. You're right, but you can't say it because you don't believe it. But we do. Death is not a full stop for Christians, is it? 
And you're, those, those people you're going to see tomorrow who you love, maybe in your family, you might be married to them, those people within themselves, at least, you know, half of them, they just know this is not all there is to it. They know this is not the end. Who's going to go to them? Who's going to teach them about Jesus? Who's going to show them? It's, it's you. I can't understand why, but they're not rushing to break down the doors of Trinity to come and hear me speak today. We're talking about fruitfulness on our front lines, and often this can get associated, can't it, with work. My uh, little dad joke about work is the guy who went for a job interview, and he's being interviewed, and the person interviewing says, so, so, um, you know, Mr. Blythe, what's your, what's your greatest weakness? And the candidate gave the answer that those of us who've been ever, uh, ever interviewed for church jobs usually say. Oh, well, sometimes I think I'm, I'm just too honest. And the interviewer said, no, no, you can never be too honest. I think that's the most amazing quality. I think that is wonderful. And the candidate looked at him and said, I don't care less what you think. The dad's in the room like that one. I asked my yoga teacher if she could be flexible. She said, yes, any time but Tuesdays. <laughs> this is not about work. It's not primarily about, about, about work. This is primarily about, about front lines, wherever God has placed us in our daily lives. But work included, that's where you worship. I mean, you worship here. We worship together in song. We worship together, and that's a gathering, and God wants us to gather. And again, when we were thinking about the story of Peter being released from jail, we saw how significant it was for the church to gather in prayer. I trust you've got the next Kingdom Come prayer meeting in your diaries. First Wednesday, every month are we going to believe what the bible says about gathering in prayer or not being here matters but but you're going to worship or at least you have the opportunity to worship with the whole of the rest of today you've got the opportunity to worship tomorrow with everything that you do the definition of worship is that you're offering it to god that you're saying god in this offering i'm saying who you are and what you're worth and if you restrict that to about 17 hours of a sermon on a Sunday, I know we can go on a bit, what about all the rest? What a depressing life it would be if this is just worship and everything else about our lives is just kind of meant to, you know, literally just pay the bills and just get us from here to there. The excitement, the adventure, the truth is that the, your work itself, and by the way, not just the, the way you do it. I'll say a bit about that. Loads of Christians get this wrong. Oh, yes, what you mean is the work itself is a bit dirty and a bit whatever. But as long as I do it in a Christian way, you know, should my job be, you know, whatever, a horrible job, as long as I do it in a Christian way, then that's no. No. It's the fabric, the very fabric of creation. It's the work itself. Now, if your job has, happens to be a Satanist, then we'll obviously need to talk that one through. But do not dismiss yourself. So many people do. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, vicars clearly are very close to God. Pretty well everything they do, that's, that's worship, clearly. Um, doctors and nurses, really good. Well done, easy, okay. Teachers, yeah, you're great. You know, the way you do what you do, that's really about here. Um, and then we move down, and you can add in the jobs that are down here. So, so if I am whatever, and I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to offend... <laughs> You can get to a point where you think, it doesn't, it's not really what I do, but as long as I do it in a Christian way, then it's okay. IT softwares, uh, software engineers in the house. God has made a creation with such precision that if any single detail was wrong, we wouldn't exist. None of this would be here. In exactly the same way that the way you program, the way you do your software engineering to make sure the world is ordered and right and appropriate is a beautiful reflection of the very nature of God. 
If you're an estate agent, I hope you've noticed that God provides shelter. If your job is money, I hope you know that Jesus talks more about money than anything else, that he's very into justice, he's very into things adding up and being done right. So it's not just about I'm nice around the office. It's not just I talk to people and offer to pray for them at the water cooler. It's not just that. It's the actual way that you add up the numbers and make sure they add up. That is an act of worship. If you're a homemaker... It's, it's the way you make your home. It's the way you nurture your family. It's not kind of, I could do this in a Christian way or I could not do it in a Christian way. It's not really the thing that would matter. It's worship. Everything is encompassed. Let's look at Colossians 1. We had it referred to earlier. Here you are, everything. Notice this, Colossians 1, 15 and 16. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him can't dumb this down 17 18 he is before all things and in him all things hold together and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased verse 19 20 for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross all 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 the context uh, for, for this book Colossians this letter uh, Colossae was a, a, a pretty small, um, insignificant kind of place, but it was prosperous, center for religion and trade, and it was a soup of ideas. There was Eastern um, the astrology, Greek mythologies of gods and goddesses, and, and Jewish themes, and massively there was the Roman Empire cult of the emperor, the, the image of Caesar everywhere, and, and actually the claim was that Caesar was the savior, the son of God. He was the mediator of hope and peace. It was a culture where the idea was that you had a whole you know, hierarchy of different um, uh, divine beings who controlled humanity. And it is clear from the letter, um, Colossians, we'll put this one up, the features of Gnosticism. There's a soup of stuff going on here where at threat is their very core belief in Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Now, Gnostic thinking is very, very prevalent today. What is it? Here's three elements, key elements. First is that the physical world of matter is essentially evil, created by evil, evil de um, de uh, deities. But there's a wise and there's a pure God who exists in an entirely non-physical reality. Middle box. Salvation consists of the spirit, which was understood in Gnostic thinking to be separate from the soul, uh, is to escape the physical prison of the body created by a conspiracy of demonic powers, separating us from our true home. Release of the spirit can only be found through the special spiritual knowledge needed to outwit those de demonic powers. Now, if you've ever had a Jehovah's Witness knock on your door, here you go, 101. You have a Mormon talk to you with their little badge saying Elder Andrew, just so that you believe that they're slightly superior to you and that they know more than you do. You've just met Gnosticism today on the street right in your face. This was attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ in Colossae. And it mirrors our own culture, doesn't it? in so many different ways. You will be encountering this all of the time. Paul's response in Colossians, in the bit just before this, thanks for so much, Colossians 1 and 15 and 16, the Son is the image of the invisible God. So those, those lovely JWs will tell you that Jesus is a created being. Those lovely Mormons will tell you that Jesus is created in order to do just the particular job. No, says Paul, he is the image of the invisible God. And the word image there 
two senses in the Greek, reflection as in the mirror and manifestation of. For in him, Jesus, all things were created. He created all things. He's not created himself. Things in heaven, on earth, visible and invisible. And then the cross is the only way. Colossians 1, 19, 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things. Jesus is the hope of the world. He's not just one of a number. And he's been revealed to us all. And if we collude, strong word, if we collude with the schemes of the evil one, the devil, by the idea that part of our lives don't really, doesn't really matter, that, that some bits of our lives are not worship, not service, ministry, the word ministry, translated service, if we collude with that idea, if we collude with a double way of thinking, Here's my kind of yellow, here's my kind of blue. Don't want to offend anyone, so just dial it down. If we collude with that, then essentially what we're doing is denying the full purposes of God. Now that's really big stuff, isn't it? <laughs> and I am absolutely speak to myself. That's what I think God wants us to see this morning. That 67%, have I got the right percentage still? Whatever it was. 77. Have I been saying it wrong all the way through? I did that deliberately so that you would notice. Do you remember when I said earlier that it really matters there are some people who can add up numbers and that's a very godly thing? I'm looking at at least one financial director in the room immediately. They, who and what do they need? They need people who believe that not just being a nice, I know I'm going to offend somebody as soon as I say any role. I don't know. Anyway, no, you know what I mean. <laughs> Whatever you would put in that slot is about a role that you might not think is, you know. If, if we just said, well, it's about trying to be nice doing that. You know, still do horrible things, you know, at work or whatever. But be nice. If, that's a collusion. That's not true. It's, it's the very way and what we're doing that God is into. And, and Paul says to these Colossians, verses back in 5 and 6 of chapter 1, if you're trying to follow on my random collection of thoughts, he says, we've heard of, talking to the Colossians and, and then coming to address this false teaching, we've heard of, he says, the faith and the love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven. And this gospel, this good news, is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. He's got the Roman Empire world in, in mind there. Why did Jesus come when he came? You know, why did Jesus come at that point in history? I think it's a pretty good argument for saying the way you could get around the whole of the known world very quickly at that stage in human history. Pretty good, I think, might be an answer, part of the answer. No lightning bolt. So I think it might be part of the answer. Um, Paul can say it's going, the, the good news, this hope is spreading. And notice faith, love, and hope. Paul, Paul constantly repeats, doesn't he? Martin Luther said, everything that is done in the world is done by hope. And it's this beautiful, beautiful thing that it's not a replacement model. Some of you, again, know the theology here. God is not going to, on the last day, you know, screw this world up and chuck it in a waste paper bin. He's in the restoration work business, the reconciling work, overcoming the effect of the fall 
overcoming the effects of sin and restoring things to how they're meant to be. So it's Gnostic thinking to think, well, the stuff that I'm doing here isn't going to last anyway. It's not got any kingdom purpose, really. It's not going to, you know, someone's got to do, again, fill in your own job. I, I don't mean literally your own job, but, you know, someone's got to do it. It matters. It really matters. Paul had to pray for the Colossians because this is huge. This is so countercultural. It's so different to the, what was it, 77%. Have I got it right now? You know, you're being molded. Those, those TV programs that I love and watch, those adverts, that, that stuff is, is, is from the 77% perspective. It's not from this perspective. Paul had to pray for them, verses 9 and 10. He said, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. You've got to have the right thinking. You've got to be filled by God's spirit with God's hope, the hope of Jesus Christ, the hope for the whole nation, so that you can live right, live a life worthy of the Lord, please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. And I absolutely know that churches and speakers like me can appear to reinforce the opposite messages. We talk about mission partners. Love you, by the way, but we pray for the people who are going back to school in September. We don't pray for stockbrokers. We, we exercise. It's, it's, it's hard because we're community and we want to honour particular challenges and particular stretches on particular people. We do it with all of the right heart and motivation, but it can give you the impression, can't it, that some things matter more than other things. And that can kind of take us out of the game. Because here's the truth, Ephesians 2.10, my favorite verse in the entire Bible. For we are God's handiwork. You are God's handiwork. Now the artists in the room, the creatives in the room, the writers in the room, kind of getting that straight away. I hope the account, you know, again, forgive me. Please don't bother emailing. Um, accountants, you know, what I mean, if you have, if you would... Take yourself out of the game. You're a homemaker. You're not working. You volunteer. You're desperately looking for work. If, you, if there's anything that's kind of taking you out of the game and you're feeling that somehow who you are and what you do is not as good as anyone else's, please know that that is not true. You are God's handiwork. And you've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared for us to do. Friends, Paul's answer to the Gnostic teaching, to the challenge of their culture, pick and mix, like Justin Arco. Oh, by the way, millennials, younger people, are more likely to believe in God and more likely to believe in life after death than people my age. Younger people are more likely to believe, not by huge percentages, but they are. When I sit and have my hair cut, the conversation usually pretty quickly gets to reincarnation. A lot of people just believe in, well, I don't really want death, so as long as I can come back, that's okay. Paul's answer to that for the people trying to live out faith in Jesus in their culture was, number one, to get to know Jesus better. To get to know the truth about who Jesus is. About the hope that is found in him. If you do that, if you get closer to Jesus, because Paul in Colossians is echoing what John records Jesus saying about abiding in him. If you abide in Jesus, you will be fruitful. So that is 101. If you have taken yourself in any way out of the game of being fruitful on your front line, the starting point is not to resolve to do better. The starting point is to resolve to get to know Jesus better and his hope for the whole world and for your life. Number two, 
If you haven't previously connected your very daily activity to the character and the very nature of God, can I urge you to do so? Can I urge you to say, what is it about the things that I spend my daily life doing, not necessarily paid work, that I spend my daily life doing that connect to the very character of God? You have someone around to eat, you're connecting to the very character of God because God is laying out a banqueting table for for everyone. But do that whatever your activity. And if you haven't done it, I urge you to do it. IT consultants and mechanics, you share in God's desire for an ordered creation. Painters, decorators, chefs, God's creativity. Accountants, therapists, health, well-being, wholeness, completeness, etc. And then finally and thirdly, connect with Jesus Connect what you do to the heart of God. Ask a friend to help you with that, genuinely, if if that's something you struggle to do. Finally, I hope you can share in this, in this statement from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. That was a a, a set of ways of, of describing belief. What do I actually believe? And here you go. It says, can you say this? about your front lines. I was created in order to worship God and to enjoy him forever. On your front lines, wherever God has placed you, where you will be tonight, tomorrow, next week, in that meeting, in that conversation, right here and now, in doing this piece of work, I was created in order to worship God and to enjoy him forever. That's the hope. That's the hope in Jesus. That's the hope that you all need and that 84.5%, or 63, or 77, really need.